Welcome. I'm Daryl Press. I'm a professor in the government department here at Dartmouth, and I'm the faculty director of the Initiative on Global Security at the Dickey Center. Um, the Initiative on Global Security is uh, the home at the Dickey Center for all programming and teaching related to international security matters. It's my great pleasure today to welcome to Dartmouth uh, my friend, uh, Professor Jonathan Kirshner from Boston College. Uh, Jonathan is truly one of the world's foremost experts on the topics of international order, foreign policy, and the international financial system, and also film, which gives you a sense of his sprawling intellect and the breadth of topics that he works on. Um, based on a very, very quick count on his CV um, this morning, if I counted right, I think he has seven serious sole authored books plus four edited volumes, something like this. So he's been writing and publishing on a broad range of topics for years and years. Professor Kirshner is here to talk with us today about the end of the American order and why we'll miss it. But I have to say on a personal note, um, I study the conduct of war for a living, and so I'm no stranger to bleak talks on depressing material. But that said, I have to say that Professor Kirshner has the rare ability to give talks that are both deeply fatalistic on one level and are yet so human and often funny that they leave you feeling better about the world and humanity than he intended. Um, lastly, there are many people we could invite to Dartmouth who would be happy to come in June or July or October, but I want to applaud you for the medal for agreeing to a talk in January because what could go wrong might get a little bit bad weather, but not so, so much. So with that, please join me in welcoming Jonathan Kirshner. Thanks so much, Daryl, um, for that overly generous introduction. And it's uh, really uh, just a pleasure to be here. Uh, those of you who are students in the room, or those of you who are students online, uh, I will share with you my thought that here at Dartmouth, this is, this is one of the best IR programs on the planet. And so you, can, you should consider yourselves lucky to be here. And it's such a pleasure uh, to be able to visit with you here today, uh, be, because again, I'm, I'm such a fan of the institution. Um, I have a tendency to run on a bit, so I'm gonna count on Daryl to get out the cane uh, when he thinks he's heard enough from me and we can move on to Q&A. And you know I'm happy to be stopped at any point, so you just let me know. Uh, again, because my talks tend to be a little overstuffed, um, here's, I'll give you a preview of what I hope to accomplish in my formal comments, and maybe I won't get to them all, uh, but if I, and if I don't, then you'll know where I was going. Um, Regarding the American order, basically I'm going the full Bruce on you. Uh, the American order is going, boys, and it ain't coming back. Um, and in that context, uh, what I'm gonna do is open with an ode to the American order. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about why uh, it's gone, why it's not gonna come back, and why the US and most of you will actually miss it, uh, which is counterintuitive for many, I know. Then I'm going to pivot a little bit and trot out an old warhorse, uh, hegemonic stability theory. Not to praise it, uh, but to discuss about why it's been misunderstood and in a very consequential way. And that was that HST, as we like to call it on street corners, um, was as much about purpose uh, as it was about power. Um, and that matters here because my story is about the ability of the U.S. to orchestrate international order or not to orchestrate international order depends or depended on both its power and its purpose. And that was fundamentally changed is its purpose. Its purpose has shifted and so its behavior will shift. And I don't think we in IR have done a great job uh, accounting for that. Why? Why is its purpose, purpose shifted? Um, here's why I think my own view is slightly distinct from a traditional IR take um, because I think it's due to changes in something that I would call the social economy, uh, the basic social and economic structure of how America runs itself domestically. Um, and the key argument is that the US social economy is in ruins. Um, and because of that, and I think again, 
our default setting in IR is not to think as much about this, but that this matters tremendously for the ability to conduct foreign policy. So those, those are the, the, the big takeaway. And so the key themes are, uh, wow, the US order, wasn't it cool? Um, and a couple of things about that are, one is that, and this is also important, it was built, that cool US order that's no longer in existence, on the ruins of previous blunders. Uh, so when the American order was built, the US went from a vision of itself as kind of pursuing something called America first uh, towards something called enlightened self-interest. Another important part of this story is that this was built upon what it perceived to be, or the people who forged the American order perceived to be the lessons of the past. Uh, but there's a sad part about lessons, which is lessons can be learned, but especially over time, lessons can be forgotten. And so if something is built on lessons and you forget the lessons, then again, some of the edifice of that structure can erode. And then again, uh, I think most distinct to my argument is that crucial domestic desiccation, um, which has to do with, again, something a little offbeat for IR, and that is the cultural practice of American capitalism. So that in the heyday of the American order, American capitalism had a culture, weird, uh, and that culture we associate with what John Ruggie called the compromise of embedded liberalism. Whereas sometimes starting around in the 1980s, the culture of American capitalism shifted towards something we could label shareholder value capitalism. And that culture of capitalism was very different and had different consequences for the American domestic social economy. And so that's really what I want to push on a little harder as to explain where this, why this is all going somewhere different. Okay, now onto the actual talk part of the talk. Um, so, the American order. Um, American order forged about three quarters of a century ago by the U.S. amid the ruins of the Second World War. And again, as a, in my view, that order has come to an end already. Um, and good riddance, uh, shout voices from an unlikely uh, broad chorus across the political spectrum. We have a large group of people who embrace something called an America first for our policy, and they look at the world's problems and say, problems, schmoblems, right? They can't be bothered with, you know, the problems of other people. They're not our problems, they're their problems. Um, but there's also uh, others who look at the practice of American power, uh, with I think the Iraq War fairly as exhibit A, and, and say, well, you know, the US simply isn't capable of actively engaging the world with adequate discipline and prudence uh, and so maybe we're kind of better off in a world in which, you know, the Americans aren't running things. Mm, but I think that they're both wrong. I think the nativists are wrong just as they were disastrously in the 1930s. And more subtly, I think the skeptics of American power underestimate the extent to which the American post-war order, pause here, with all of its visible and profound flaws, nevertheless contributed to an unprecedented era of peace, prosperity, and security, things that we will come to miss. Okay, still, as I said, in the US, I think really few people don't shed tears uh, over the end of the American international order. And I think that we can date the real pivot here, if we want to choose a, a moment in history, it would be 1916, 1916, it would be 2016, 100 years later, uh, or 90 years later, my math is getting off, it's 100. Um, and not in the general election of that year, which a lot of people point to as a profound sea change in American politics, which arguably it was, uh, but what was more interesting for thinking about American orchestration of order, it was the nominating processes in both parties during that political season in 2016. The fact that the Democratic candidate, Hillary Clinton, had to renounce uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which she negotiated and went around talking about how it was the gold standard of international cooperation. And yet to secure the nomination of her party for president, she had to say, what, I never even heard of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. What are you talking about? Uh, and, you know, and, and step back away from it. Similarly, and perhaps even more astonishingly, is the, I'm going to say, sudden, about-face uh, take 
by the Republican Party on foreign policy, foreign trade, and international engagement more generally. Just a a transformation in what the Republican Party stood for on all these fronts. So these nominating processes made clear that the two major American political parties were suddenly disposed in ways internationally that was fundamentally different and to some extent even the opposite than they had been for a very long time. And that's why I think this watershed moment really signaled to us that that order was gone. Okay, so the order's gone, but what was it? Uh, well, back, back in 45 to 1950, the U.S. did some things that for it then were quite unprecedented. Right? The North Atlantic Treaty Association, permanent alliances, the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, uh, the founding of the International Monetary Fund, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the United Nations, on and on and on, all this institution building, all these international commitments, and the U.S. paid a disproportionate share of building and maintaining these organizations. At times, its behavior was a little exploited. We could talk about that. But nevertheless, it ponied up the dough to make these things happen. Why? Why did the U.S. do that? Did somebody like paint the kick me sign on the back of the U.S.? And the U.S. just did this in a kind of charitable way? Um, again, back to my argument about lessons. Think about what the last half century looked like to the founders of that order. And let's start with World War I, because I think uh, we tend to forget uh, that mass slaughter. Uh, World War I, World War II gets a lot of press. Uh, World War I was a horrifying, horrifying experience in which millions upon millions upon millions of people died, not for many of them obvious reasons. Often, generations of young men in so many countries sprinting into machine gun fire. World War I was not an experience anybody wanted to repeat. Uh, and why did the World War I end? Because the U.S. came charging in, uh, tipped the balance of power, and the Allies won because the U.S. changed that stalemate. And so then the U.S. says, oh, here we are in Europe. Maybe we should be this engaged internationalist power. And then they said, nah, let's not do that. And, and we, have, we go from Wilson to Harding, the quote unquote return to normalcy, and an, and an inward turn away from international engagement. And so, U.S. foreign policy in the interwar years is, I think, still, even though it's contested, appropriately characterized as isolationist, and its foreign economic policies are appropriately characterized as narrow minded and protectionist, both on the foreign policy side and on the economic policy side. These were clear expressions of America first. Uh, Again, the demand for the repayment of war debts, for example, after the First World War, and the consequences it had for the functioning of the international financial economy. Um, Here's a question they ask themselves. So how did that go? Um, And I think many of them, or at least a crucial number of them, decided not so well. Uh, What did those policies contribute to? They contributed in an important way to the Great Depression. There was a lot of attention paid to American protectionism, the Smoot-Hawley tariff, and rounds and rounds of protectionism after that. But not to be underestimated is the American contribution to international financial fragility with its short-sighted and, again, inward-looking monetary policies that contributed greatly to the global financial crisis of 1931 that was probably more consequential in setting the world onto the depths of the Great Depression than even the rounds of protectionism were. Again, both arguably centered in decisions made in the United States. Uh, This was also the permissive environment in which radical fascists and militarists were able to thrive in countries like Germany and Japan. And so suddenly, even though we're pursuing a quote unquote America first foreign policy and keeping out of the world's problems, the world does not look a lot safer uh, with kind of Nazis and Japanese militarism uh, imagining conquering different halves of the world on the rise. And, and it all leads to a World War II, which uh, was even worse, even more horrifying uh, than World War I. And so you're coming out of World War II. You're looking at the, not just the ruins of the war, But the war, the depression, and the war before that, and the foreign policy choices that were made in that context, and also there are real post-war fears. And fear is an important word here. Would the depression come back? Was it the war that pulled the economies out of the depression? And after the war, would we have a new depression? 
people were uncertain. Um, would there be a third world war? You know, we started to learn to number them uh, back then, and there was real anxiety about what would happen next. Nobody knew on the foreign policy and on the foreign economic front what was actually going to happen uh, in the years following the Second World War. But one thing they knew was that they'd made a lot of mistakes in the past, and they wanted to avoid them. And so at that time, many people shared the view that this whole isolationism and America first thing did not work. And so they went instead with something we can call enlightened self-interest. And I think it's important that we note the full phrase there. Enlightened self-interest still has the phrase self-interest in it. So this was still something designed to advance America's interest in the world, but we have this enlightened part, meaning it was more far-sighted. That America would pursue goals that the political scientist Arnold Wolfers would later characterize as milieu goals. That if you're a great power, you want to exercise your foreign policy in a way that makes the world more amenable to your values and to make your allies and friends feel comfortable in their affiliations with you. Um, and so the U.S. embarked upon this project and again bore some costs to try and shape the general way in which the world worked. Uh, I asked you how the first policy went. I said, how did that go? It went pretty dismally. How did, how did enlightened self-interest go? Um, uh, at the risk of, 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 of eliciting some contestation, I'm going to call it the most successful foreign policy and grand strategy in the history of foreign policies and grand strategies. Uh, it was followed by unprecedented U.S. and global economic growth and prosperity. There were certainly wars and lots and lots and lots of horrible things that happened. Uh, but no epical great power wars, rather, for a number of reasons, unprecedented great power peace. But again, if you're in 1945 to 1950 and you don't know what's coming next, and somebody says to you, do this and here's what you're going to get. Uh, here's what the world's going to look like. Here's what Japan's going to look like. Here's what Germany's going to look like. Here's what Europe and Asia is going to look like in general. Here's what the world economy is going to look like over the next several decades. Uh, do you think they would have signed on to that? Uh, I think they would have leapt at that and, th and thought you were being ridiculously unrealistic in your optimistic expectations of what we could possibly hope to achieve with this foreign policy. Um, so again, successful beyond the wildest dreams of the founders of that order. Um, but as I noted, fast forward uh, a mere 75 years later, and in my view, we have an unraveling um, of that consensus, that internationalist consensus. Why? Again, lessons can be learned, lessons can be unlearned, especially, I think, all those horrors of the first half of the 20th century horrifying war, horrifying depression, horrifying war, they fade from view, they seem almost anachronistic, and we have a kind of, I'm going to use the word naive view, um, that they can't return. In my view, this perspective is wrong. Uh, here's where the card carry I have a card, but it's, not, it's in my wallet, I won't take it out. Uh, as a card-carrying realist, uh, I'm here to tell you that, and this may be dispiriting, we are not better, stronger, smarter, faster, more clever than the people from the 1930s. Civilization is a thin layer of order resting above a pitiless anarchy. And as the US withdraws from the world, we will see the consequence of that withdrawal in the rise of unsavory actors in many places. The crisis of illiberalism in Europe from this perspective and the crisis of illiberalism globally from this perspective is an actual threat to the United States. And we might want to pause here and note that the rise of nativism and nationalism, the crisis of civilization within the U.S. is also an important crisis for the U.S. Both in terms of security and economic prosperity, a transactionalist, nationalist, nativist, new America first foreign policy, the pursuit of naked, norm dismissive, zero sum self-interest instead of the enlightened interest of the American order that I was celebrating, will not only contribute to global and political instability, it will be detrimental to US interest even defined most narrowly. 
So on the one hand, uh, as a prescriptive matter, despite my fondness for William Shatner's No Tears for Caesar rap, you should go on YouTube and look this up, uh, I do want to mourn uh, the end of the American order. Uh, I even have a slogan for you that I've trademarked, which is the liberal international economic order. It's not just for liberals. Um, nevertheless, as an analytical evaluation, I want to argue that that order is toast, unlikely to be retrievable, and again, Here's where I think I have something relatively distinct to say, which is I root these changes not to shifts in relative American power, but to a transformation of American purpose. And so that's, I guess, my no relatively novel point number one is my emphasis on purpose over power. My relatively novel point number two for this discussion is to root this shift in purpose uh, to changes in the U.S domestic, political, social, economic setting. And so it's, it's not about kind of a shift in American power the way we often think about the way orders uh, uh, change or, or end or not end. So I want to do talk a little bit about uh, the role of purpose in, in changing American behavior. Um, the end of the American order, and I think this is important to recognize as well, the clause I'm about to introduce, the origins of the American order were, was both a function of power and purpose. I'm not being dismissive of power. You know, you don't have the power, you're not getting up and getting out of bed in the morning. You have to have the ability to have the order. Um, but nevertheless, there is this important question of purpose. And in the contemporary setting, in my view, as I've already said, changes to purpose are more consequential drivers of change um, than changes to power. And I think here's where I think we briefly revisiting hegemonic stability theory, yes, I can kind of hear you groaning, uh, can be helpful in clarifying this distinction. I don't want to fight about hegemonic stability theory. I want to fight about how we've come to understand hegemonic stability theory. Intellectual hero of mine, Charles Kindleberger, kind of formulated this informally in 1973, and this was kind of a notion. He didn't call it a theory, and it's picked up by Krasner and Gilpin and a bunch of others, and there are sort of good deductive reasons why we understand that a leading state might pursue this this far-sighted policy of orchestrating an international order, even bearing costs in the short run to do so. Okay, so that, that kind of makes sense for reasons the theory articulates. And this theory is developed not as a theory. This was a kind of informal notion in the 1970s. And then Bob Cohane, who doesn't even like the theory, comes along in 1980 and defines it for us. And here's Cohane's definition, and it is right. Uh, right as, as embraced by us in the IR discipline. The theory, as he defines it, is that changes in the relative power resources available to major states will explain changes in international, international regimes in that the concentration of power leads to stability and that this will falter as the hegemon's margin of resource superiority over its partners declines. And Cohen rightly describes this theory as, quote, systemic and parsimonious. And this was hegemonic stability theory as embraced, and again, entirely rooted in materialist conceptions of power. Okay, fine, but that's not what Uncle Charlie said. That's what I called Charles Kindleberger, even though we weren't, we weren't that close. Um, Charles Kindleberger said something fundamentally different. In 1973, he wrote, the Great Depression was so deep and so long because the international economic system was rendered instable by British inability and American unwillingness to stabilize it. Note the crucial role of both power and purpose in Kindleberger's formulation. Brit the British, perhaps inclined to lead, lacked the power, lacked the capacity to lead in that context. The Americans, despite having the power, were unwilling to exercise it. And this was not a casual comment uh, by Kindleberger. He repeated this point over and over again, even in 1981, after Cohen had articulated the so-called theory of hegemonic stability. He wrote in 1981, from 1919 to 1939, Britain could not, and the U.S. would not, act in the capacity of world leader. 
And I think Kindleberger is right. I think we need to go back and recognize what he's talking about when he's talking about international leadership. And that neither the origins or the unraveling of the American order are intelligible without attending to purpose. A preponderance of power is insufficient to explain why the U.S. was willing to forge, finance, and orchestrate the American-led international order after the Second World War. There was nothing inevitable about the forging of that order. The order, the so-called American order, was contested and improvised from its origins, and other plausible paths were advocated. What followed need not have been. Again, to some ears, this sounds incongruous because the foundations of the order look obvious in retrospect. Uh, the 1947 extraordinarily far-sighted Marshall Plan and numerous other exercises in American heavy lifting, such as, again, the establishment of the GATT and the IMF. Um, despite revisionist accounts that stress post-war U.S. policies as inevitable outcomes of an insatiable and expansionist demands of American capitalism. In fact, again, this was deeply contested at the time, and it's easy in retrospect to underestimate the strength of countervailing isolationist forces. Um, Why do we have a GATT? We have a GATT because the U.S. Senate rejected the International Treaty Trade Organization, the ITO, which was the real American trade regime that they wanted to invent at the time. And it was not just still influential congressional isolationists who opposed the Marshall Plan and the creation of the IMF. You know who else opposed the creation of the IMF? The American Bankers Association, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, an enormously powerful institution, uh, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, they all uh, were against the idea of the International Monetary Fund. And as for the Marshall Plan, the American Bankers Association was bitterly opposed to it, thinking not only would it fail, but if somehow it was successful, all it would really be doing was coddling European socialism, which was not in the American interest to do. Additionally, the emergence of the Cold War was almost undoubtedly necessary to provide the domestic political support necessary for the creation of an ad hoc, improvised, piecemeal American order in its origins. And weirdly, perhaps not even any Cold War, but the specific Cold War we got. Uh, Robert Jervis has argued, I think convincingly, that there was very few things that could have substituted for the Korean War in giving us the Cold War that we got as we understood it. And Jervis and others have argued further that the Korean War was kind of strange, uh, that it was a, a war of curious origin rooted in miscalculations and complex and idiosyncratic alliance politics. And so without all of those odd factors, we might not have gotten the Cold War as we knew it, which was probably crucial in forging the political support for the orchestration of American order. Um, And with all that still, in 1952, again, I'm more into nominations than elections, uh, at the Republican nominating conference, it was bitterly fought, and it wasn't settled on the first ballot. There was Dwight Eisenhower, who eventually got the nomination, but who was he fighting against? Robert Taft, uh, the long-standing and leading isolationist, who strongly opposed the formation of NATO, among many other things. If I think he opposed Len Lease uh, as well, if I'm remembering that history correctly. And again, there's a bitterly fought nominating process, and it really isn't until 1952, which is a long trip from 1947, um, and then you have the Korean War in between with a nomination of Eisenhower and probably his election in which we really do at this point get a broad, bipartisan, internationalist consensus. Yeah, let's have an order. Let's run it. Uh, you know, this is probably going to be in order just to do so. Uh, and and it, it is really moving forward for many decades afterwards. Um, So in some, you know, after World War II, the U.S. does indeed reject the failed isolationist and American first policies of the interwar period and embraces far-sighted international engagement. But this was a debate that was held, and tipping the balance in that debate was the desire to learn from the bitter lessons of the past. Now, I've talked a little bit more about those bitter lessons of the First and Second World Wars, but when we get into the social economy, we also want to remember that among those very bitter lessons of the past 
were the catastrophic economic policies associated with the Great Depression and its exacerbation. And so the American order as it emerges in the first three decades after the Second World War is associated with a distinct culture of capitalism. Again, not a phrase that comes naturally to IR professors, but a set of economic practices that was also informed by the traumas and the failures of the interwar years. The Great Depression was really awful, uh, and it, it led many to question whether capitalism could even work and survive, and that a different way of practicing capitalism, even if we embrace the notion that capitalism is the way to go, uh, that we need to temper it in a way and practice it in a way and have a culture of capitalism that is distinct from the one that came before it. But again, lessons can be forgotten. Uh, and the American international order, in my view, has ended when the US no longer had the, not when the US no longer had the capacity to lead, but when it lost interest in doing such things. And if I'm right and the American system has shuttered, uh, John Eikenberry makes an interesting observation. He says, this is not how it was supposed to happen. Uh, he writes, across ancient and modern eras, orders built by great powers have come and gone, but they have usually ended in murder, not suicide. Um, but again, it, even that is a gesture at the idea that this was the hegemon itself stepping back as opposed to being pushed. So what happened, and again, if I have two relatively novel claims to make in this presentation today, one is that Purpose is as big a part of the story as power. Uh, and the other is that the change in purpose derives from changes in the American domestic, social, cultural practices of its economy. Um, and that this is where American purpose changes. And let me start uh, this discussion, uh, which I will keep to 12 minutes, six minutes, seven minutes. Seven minutes. Um, um, I, I, I did want you to get, I did want you to uh, have, be armed with the cane as necessary. Um, but I'm still going to start this by noting the observation of a youthful, scruffy scholar from 1998. And that, a very handsome young man said, that the single greatest security threat to the U.S. was the internal atrophy of its national vitality and that its growing inequality, quote, would intensify distributional conflicts and make it difficult to pursue far-sighted national goals. And indeed, I think I was right about that. Um, and that the story of the American economy is that increasing e inequality Sustained and cumulative over four decades is a defining characteristic of the American economy. I want to be cautious professory here and say that it is impossible to draw straight lines from income inequality to state power or, or make simple generalizable conclusions about inequality and almost anything. Why? Because perceptions of inequality, cultural norms regarding fairness, assessments of future opportunities, and so many other things matter tremendously in understanding the political consequences of different levels of inequality in various places. We're very clear about that. We're not drawing straight lines here. We're making the argument that the long-term secular stagnation of median household income and a dramatic increase in the wealth of those at the very top have social consequences that inform debates over, back to purpose, interpretations of what is best for the national interest and interpretations of what foreign policy choices are best suited uh, to pursue those interests. And again, as always in my stories, history matters. And I think a crucial tipping point here is not simply the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008, but the divergent experiences that different parts of American society had in its wake. And that these are what further fuel the reemergence of America's isolationist instincts. Skipping ahead, um, we note the incredible power the U.S. had at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, we have some scholars in this room. Uh, I'm going to quote this because they're here. 
who said eminently and correctly um, that the unprecedented concentration of power and resources in the U.S. generally renders inoperative the constraining effects of the systemic properties long central to research and international relations. This is an important and seminal contribution. My view is at the same time, this underlying atrophy of the American social economy is taking place. And that we reach now for Sam Huntington, who at that same moment observed that a state in command of such immense power is, quote, normally able to maintain its dominance for a long time until it is weakened by internal decay or by forces from outside the system. Again, my story is the story um, of internal decay and a shift in the culture of American capitalism. We will pick this up, I think, in Q&A about the shift from Ruggie's compromise of embedded liberalism to the reification of something called shareholder value, uh, which transforms America into a sort of winner-take-all financialized economy. And the financialization of the American economy is a crucial aspect of this. And the hubris of the American hyperpower, not just in things like in the Iraq war, but in its decadent financial folly, uh, comes to home to roost in the second decade of the 21st century in the form of the global financial crisis um, in addition to its failed wars. But the key question is, to whom were these bills presented? We had to save the financial system. Sorry. We didn't necessarily have to save the bankers. Um, but mainstream America bore the disproportionate costs of this system that was already under stress. I think this was catastrophic and underappreciated. As Martin Wolf, no, a Thatcherite, uh, said of the global financial crisis, um, what we saw was a system in which well-connected insiders are shielded from loss but impose massive costs on everybody else. Wolf argues that Wall, correctly that Wall Street titans who caused the crisis mostly walked off with large fortunes and while tens of millions of innocent people's lives were ruined. And my argument is that it was the global financial crisis and its aftermath that shredded an already fraying American social fabric. Uh, from 2005 to 2014, as the rich got much, much richer, 81% of U.S. households had flat or fall falling real income. Again, quoting Martin Wolf, this is a system of, quote, rigged capitalism, which leads to a phenomenon of plutopopulism, wherein political entrepreneurs posture as populists while guarding the interests of wealthy patrons. And so if I could just tie a bow on this point, um, all of this had a catastrophic effect on American politics, both inward, but also with regard to its ability to productively engage and orchestrate an international order, a gap between its power and its ability to achieve its political goals as a function not of a reduction in its relative military power compared to other states, but rather its domestic political dysfunction that prevents it from exercising an ept foreign policy. So if I could tie a bow on this point, uh, the American order was built on a desire to learn from the lessons of the past, in particular the Great Depression and the unchecked rise of fascism. And the American order ended with a vast forgetting uh, a shift back towards a culture of capitalism that prioritized shareholder value in which the rich took what they could uh, and the workers were left behind uh, over a shared purpose. And the bitter irony is that this was exactly what the architects of the embedded liberal order were trying to avoid. It was what they feared. If we let capitalism run amok, it will lead to a radical and dysfunctional domestic political backlash to the detriment of all. And that's the forgetting we've had, and that's where I think we've ended up, and that is, I think, the most important driver of the dysfunctions of American foreign policy uh, moving forward. I know I'm already over time, so I'll stop there. Thank you. What we'll do at this point, if you're amenable, is we have a good amount of time for, for questions from the audience. We have both an audience here and a large audience online. 
And so what I'll do is I think I'm going to try to give preference, at least initially, to people in the room if they have questions. Yeah, they brave the snow. <coughs> exactly. Would you like to call people? Would you like me to call people? I'll call people. And Tom, um, if you start seeing questions online, why don't you get my attention, and then you can read those. So to begin, people in the audience. Yes, John. So I'm, I'm sympathetic to your argument. And I, I love the focus on interest. I think it's what's been missing for a long time. Uh, and a while back, I would have thought that your argument was definitely correct. Um, Jeff Frieden, who's not in the room, sorry, Friedman, uh, Professor Jarbuth, who's not here, but convinced me that this perspective not, might not be correct. Uh, and so he's got some new work that shows that it's not the same thing to say that not supporting new free trade, trade agreements is not the same thing as saying that we're selling out free trade. In fact, support for it seems pretty high, and trade as a share of GDP hasn't gone down very much. That you actually still see a huge amount of support for NATO and alliance commitments. If you look at see the vote on the Senate, if you look at support initially for Ukraine. And if you look at NATO expansion, there seems to be actually a lot more support than you might think. So my question to you is this. We've seen a lot of people who have said it was the end of the order a lot of times, as other people have written around here. How do we know you're right and that this time is different? Okay, so that is a great question. Um, and let's, let's be very clear. We don't know if I'm right. I could easily be wrong, and I've been wrong in the past. Um, but here's why I'm making the arguments that I'm making. Um, I do respect the fact that public opinion surveys in practice are often supportive of the notions that you mentioned. Um, but I'm not convinced the extent to which that's going to translate into specific American policy choices moving forward. Um, I also don't want to couch this in terms of free trade versus protectionism, um, although I am a little anxious about what's going to happen uh, to the NATO alliance in the future. Uh, but back to your point about free trade and protectionism, the, 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 the problem, the mistake that the Americans made with regard to free trade was not free trade. It was in not remembering that free trade will inevitably generate winners and losers. And that therefore, if you, the system is supposed to be fair, then there has to be a way of understanding that not because they're lazy uh, or not special or not gifted, uh, the losers created by the embrace of free trade ought to be somehow, if not compensated, then live in a society in which it is easier for them to transition to new opportunities that are presented by the environment, uh, the economic environment. And that's where we've fallen short. And that's where we talk about the shift from um, the embedded liberal order to the shareholder value system. The embedded liberal order was designed specifically to create space for domestic social economic purpose to cushion people from the very rough edges of capitalism, which are rough and which are inevitable. I mean, I, I'm pretty much a back of the envelope capitalist, uh, but I kind of understand that that's going to generate winners and losers, and it's really rough stuff. Whereas Shareholder value capitalism is just everybody gets what they deserve and take everything you want, that you can get. If you look at the data on rewards from capitalism, what you find is, I will use the word, obscene increases in executive compensation so that executives were compensated to some extent in the 50s and then to some crazy extent in the 80s and then to some... Mr. Burns from the Simpsons levels uh, in, in the contemporary era, that cannot be traced to their relative productivity in society. Whereas similarly, in the United States in the age that the, of embedded liberalism, worker wages and worker productivity tracked very closely from the late 40s to the early 70s. And then a yawning gap emerges and grows wider and wider and wider for the next four decades. So even by the most narrow metric of capitalism, of what's fair, workers are not being paid their marginal product. Why? Because the economic textbooks have it wrong. Factors of production are actually not rewarded uh, at the margins of their profitability. Actually, most firms make profits, and it's a bare-knuckled fight as to who gets what. 
And who gets the most what? The people with the economic and political power. So that it, that's why I keep using that phrase, culture of capitalism, to explain the behavior of these actors. In the 1950s, executives had different perspectives on how much we are supposed to take uh, from our firms and what our workers deserve. It wasn't dictated by economic theory. It was shaped by social norms. And those social norms have changed. And so we're living in this democratically dangerous plutocracy uh, where there is such a vast concentration of wealth at the very top. It's a long trip from your question, but I want to get those points in. So, so if, I, if I'm following up on Jonathan's question, I say, what, what, you have a sense, you have an interpretation of the American society and the American economy, and a sense that makes you feel uncomfortable. Thank you. Um, but if Jonathan asked, what are the principal pieces of evidence that you can point to that somebody skeptical might look at that evidence and say, dear God, you're right, there is a deep and systemic problem today. And one piece of evidence you said is your, it's, it's overall levels of inequality in the United States, um, uh, um, uh, corporate leadership income. Is there anything else? Is there anything else you can point to to Jonathan or to Jeff Friedman and say? So on this point, although I think I reached these thoughts on an independent track, I really embrace fully, and that's why I quoted him twice, uh, the work of Martin Wolf here. Uh, again, I think Martin Wolf is a very interesting uh, thinker for us here. He, he's a journalist, so, um, in that he was in the 80s, you know, a Thatcher and even Reagan cheerleader, uh, a free marketeer, and very excited about the changes that were being made back then, which was this transfer toward a certain type of capitalist practice. And the global financial crisis for him was a kind of shattering experience in which he learned um, that unfettered capitalism didn't necessarily do the things he thought it was going to do, even though he remained a capitalist. But then, and again, it's not just a global financial crisis. It's what happens in the decade following the global financial crisis in the economy in which he sees in this astonishing concentration of wealth the emergence of something he calls Pluto-populism. And he says there's a problem, which is if the populists are, if the plutocracy is like one-tenth of one percent of the population, how in a democracy uh, do they get the policies they want? And so he says they do it through this notion of Pluto-populism, which is finding politicians who will pose as populists while protecting their interests. Now, again, it's a long trip to your store, but the political consequences of that, I think, are directly relatable to what, to me, looks like rabid political dysfunction in this country. Uh, I, I would not call this country right now as a smooth-running political machine. Uh, we can go into reasons for that or how I would see manifestations of that, but to me, it looks bizarre beyond any expression of American politics I would have ever expected to have seen in my lifetime. And Wolf would attribute that to a purposeful strategy of Pluto-populism in which the very wealthy distract working class people uh, by pitching them essentially the culture wars. And my point about foreign policy is that a nation that is so riven with radical domestic political polarization is not going to be a country that's going to be really good at practicing foreign policy. Uh, and so that's the link that maybe I didn't make as clear in the talk, that you just, it's that a far-sighted foreign policy that pursues long-term interests, that provides putting up costs that are designed to advance the long-term shared national interest of the country, are less likely to emerge in a country that is bitterly divided and sees the existential threat to their way of life, not coming from some foreign enemy, but from fellow citizens within their borders. And that's the fight they're having. And foreign policy stuff at that point is an irrelevant luxury. And who cares? And who's it helping anyway? People I don't like to begin with. I mean, this is, you know, you really need to be in pretty decent shape to pursue these Wolfers milieu goals. Um, and, I, and, and so I guess the, maybe the, the part of the trip I didn't fill in properly is that this type of domestic political 
and, and political economy is not well conditioned to pursue graceful foreign policy choices. Okay. Let me see if there's another question in the audience. Yes, sir. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, two comments on the power side. You can't really exert power if your debt to GDP is north of 100%. I mean, Ferguson's talked about having, when your defense budget is above your interest payments, it's game over in terms of empire. So I think the whole idea of the world order being, the American order being over, we're done purely from a financial perspective. The rest is sort of noise, quite frankly. I don't think, when you, don't, when you have $2 trillion deficits a year, the idea of a foreign policy that is expansionary and involved with the rest of the world, I think, is a non-starter. Uh, the second thing in terms of the purpose, I, I would translate that maybe to national will, of willing to do that. The one thing the Americans have found out after Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, the willingness to take casualties is about zero. Um, I think for the right reasons. So you have to have, if you want to have a, a, an interventionist foreign policy or one that is engagement, you have to have the willingness to take casualties. I think politically that is a complete non-starter. It was probably 20 years ago. Now it's even less. So the question is, if you don't have the power from an economic perspective and you don't have the will to be engaged with the rest of the world because of these disasters, why not say, it's great the American order is over. Let's move on to something different, far from Bretton Woods. So in, this, in the spirit of the room, uh, I'm, uh, I think both of your points are fine, but I'll disagree with both of them. Um, on the first one, most of the professors in this room uh, know I'm the boy who cried crisis <laughs> and spent 20 years giving talks about how we're on the precipice of some kind of financial ruin and that's the end of everything and just forget about it. And this gets back to the point of how do you, how do, how do you, why should we think you're right? And I said, well, I've been wrong before. And one of the things I've been wrong about is, I mean, I was actually, uh, let's pat me on the back. I was actually prescient about the risk uh, of a global financial crisis in the two or three years leading up to the global financial crisis. Pat, pat back on the back. I was very good about that. Um, but in terms of the f domestic financial sustainability of the American order, I had given talks about that for a very long time, and it just keeps not happening. So maybe you're right. Maybe it's happening now, but we, I think we should reach to... Uh, the wisdom of Herbert Stein, uh, Ford's uh, uh, economic advisor, who said, when something's unsustainable, it will stop. Uh, so if the American debt levels you know, are unsustainable and in a consequential way for the ability for the US to have a certain size defense establishment, then, then that will happen and we'll see it. But we keep having, we meaning me, <laughs> keep raising these concerns, and yet whatever threshold we write down on a piece of paper, and say, well, you get to this point, man, forget it, it's toast, you just can't do it, and we just blow past that level, and then we do it again and again and again. Now, I, my instincts are with you that the, the financial trajectory looks unsustainable, but at a certain point, you have to say, well, I, I, every time I set the, the limit at which it can't go on, it turns out I was wrong about that. So I'm not convinced that the American ability to project its hard power is on the precipice of being fully undermined by its fiscal or debt profligacy. Although, again, entering into an era of sustained higher interest rates will only put more pressure uh, on that situation. On your second point, I just want to make it a little more subtle. I mean, my, I think in terms of politics, not war. And so what I'm interested in is the American ability to be a sustained and engaged player in important parts of the world, and for me, important parts of the world are Europe and Asia. Not to go there and fight wars there, um, but rather to participate in alliance systems with capable allies that gives them the confidence to sustain their own domestic polities and to balance against would-be threats. Uh, if the war comes, uh, then, it's, then, the, then the whole policy failed, right? The policy is really designed to prevent that war from coming. And so my focus is not on willingness to take casualties to support the American order. My, my focus is on willingness to spend the money to make clear to allies in crucial parts of the world that we are engaged and committed partners in what you're trying to do, which is a political act more than a military act. <laughs> 
going to go to Professor Lynn next, but is there an undergraduate? Are you an undergraduate? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go to an undergraduate first then. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to push back a little bit here. Um, Pushing is good. <laughs> so U.S. GDP outpaced China for the first time in 40 years. We have we have the lowest unemployment rate we have and have had in half a century. You have expanding NATO. You have an expanded NATO, U.S. honoring its commitments in Southeast Asia and now in the Middle East. Where does all of this fit into and there's also a bipartisan consensus on China. So where does that all fit into your theory that the American moment is over? Because I kind of see a revitalization and a more measured foreign policy in the Biden administration. So several things, and this, that's a great question. Um, the American bipartisan consensus on China is childish. Um, it's just every member of all parties costlessly saying, oh, China, they're over there, they're big and they're bad, and we don't like them, and we're tough against them. Um, but there are some basic realities here about the balance of military power in the region um, that the U.S. is going to have to reckon with, no matter how tough it wants to talk about China and how, uh, how powerful this bipartisan, hawkish stance toward China is in consensus. Person, I mean, this is a judgment call. Your judgment may be uh, different than mine, and that's eminently legitimate. But I don't think that the U.S. has a tremendous taste for getting into a shooting war with China. And I do think that the regional balance of power in the theater is shifting against the United States. And the United States would be foolish not to recognize that and to reorient its military postures in order to understand that reality. So in that sense, um, even as the U.S. has a massive military, and an enormous and resilient economy, it nevertheless is living in a world in which other powers have capabilities that always need to be understood and respected. And by respect, I don't mean genuflected before. I mean, you have to understand the limits to your own power and the capabilities of other states. Otherwise, you're going to make a lot of really costly and bloody mistakes. And to me, I don't see a way out of understanding that China is going to be more influential politically and perhaps even regionally, militarily in that region. And again, that doesn't mean I want to pick up my stakes and go home. It means I want to orient my military posture as subordinate to my political strategy of supporting regional allies to give them the confidence to pursue their own autonomy and interests. Um, as for the other parts of your question, you know, yeah, I mean, again, massive economy, a massive military, and I, I don't mean to suggest that either of those, of those things are not the case. In terms of U.S. foreign policy and its robustness, I must say, I'm not a super, I mean, I have partisan preferences, but I'm not a, a, a super partisan player, but I have been, I think, if I was a professor giving grades, uh, that the Biden administration has been dealt a series of tough crises, one after the other, and done as well as we could possibly hope for from a politicized presidency and administration dealing with the political situation and trying to muddle through, and, and muddling through is underestimated as good foreign policy, um, the crisis as, as they come. Um, you know, is it perfect? No. What, is, there, is there such a thing as perfection? Probably not. So, when you say, you look at the Biden administration and say, well, you still have some orchestration of American leadership, okay, that may be hanging by a thread. Uh, I mean, there is going to be an election in this country uh, in, in a few months. And that election, most, um, I don't study American politics, thankfully, um, but I think most observers agree that that election can go either way. Um, and if, uh, let me use the phrase, the, 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 the nominee of the other party, uh, wins that election, then I think you will see a fundamental and not easily reversible transformation of the American disposition in its attitudes uh, towards how it engages the world. And that will not look like the continuity of the American order in Europe or Asia or anywhere that, that we've been accustomed to. Now, if I could Add further to that, speculatively, let's say Biden wins the election in 2024, which is a plausible outcome. Um, four years ago, he said he was running as kind of an interim guy. Um, so even in the Democratic Party, there's a generation looming behind Biden. 
So the Republican Party, I think, has been overtaken by nativist nationalism. And if that party comes to power, then American order, done. Uh, the Democratic left, uh, however, if it gets its turn as the nominee of the, and, become, and then seizes the presidency, the, the practice of their foreign policy is likely to be closer to my initial comments about attitudes about what American power is, quote unquote, good for. Uh, in the world, and is likely to be more skeptical and cautious. So you can say, Biden seems to have tended the flame of the American international order as best as one could hope for in this context. Um, and, and again, my reaction is, you know, the sell-by date on Biden is, is somewhere between eight months and four years and eight months. And what follows beyond that is not, is, is to my eyes, to my prognostication, a leadership less likely to be inclined to tend to that flame. So we, we have about 12 more minutes. Um, let me take Professor Lind and then the gentleman sitting next to her and then maybe the gentleman. Thank you so much for a great talk. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, I, I certainly take your point about the domestic divisions and all sorts of ways in which the, the, the state is in a bad state. Um, I'm just wondering, can we still have the order in spite of that? And does, does fixing the domestic problems necessarily come at the expense of the order? Um, so, so for example, I'm thinking there, there is still, so, so, so Josh talked about, don't we still have a lot of power, right? And, and I, would, I would add, don't we also still have some sense of purpose, right? So as, as Jonathan mentioned, yeah, Hillary and, and Bernie and Trump all rejected TPP, but, but generally people didn't reject American alliances, um, one of the mainstays of the order. And they, they generally, the public is still very much in favor of free trade and so on. So it seems like you picked a couple prominent things amidst a bigger landscape where there is actually more support for the order. Um, and then also related to this, can we fix the domestic inequality and so on? D does fixing that require bankrupting the order? <laughs> or like, like is, is it, I mean, I've been mm -hmm. told for a very long time that like, oh, it's an order on the cheap and, and we don't actually pay that much and so on. <laughs> if that's correct, then you know, maybe we just need to do different tax policies or, or whatever the case may be. And so it's our domestic policies that would help fix the order and we could, sorry, that would fix the domestic issues. So I, I hope I'm, I'm making sense here. But the, the question is, is do we still have more purpose, more of a sense of purpose than you're, you're suggesting amongst the American people? Um, I do take your point that just it's going to be more chaotic to govern this mess that we've created, but I'm wondering if, can it be rescued and, and would rescuing it require jettisoning the order? So on your second question, my answer is definitely no. I don't think that to fix America's domestic problems, we have to abandon the notion of engaged internationalism, even in a semi-costly way. So that's, although I do think if we solve the problem of purpose, the international system is a more challenging place to orchestrate nowadays than it was in, you know, in, in the heyday of so-called American hegemony. But I do, I do share your view, I think, to the extent that I heard it correctly, um, that there are clear paths forward to solve many of the problems of the American domestic social economy. Um, and, and many states, you see some of these policies being put in place. And many people gesture at some of the emergency post-COVID policies that the Biden administration had put in place as accomplishing more on that front uh, than had been accomplished uh, on kind of social democracy uh, in some time. Um, so I do think we know, as you mentioned tax policies, uh, what we would need to do to try and 
right the ship of state of the social economy. The question is whether there is a critical domestic political mass uh, to achieve those policies. Um, the country strikes me as being pretty divided uh, and, and divided fairly closely. Um, and there, so I guess I'm expressing some skepticism as whether we'd be able to, what I would call, do the right thing. And again, because this is so atypical for international relations scholarship, I do want to triple down on this notion that it has to do with the cultural practices of American capitalism. Um, that capitalism comes in a lot of flavors, and that those flavors are not dictated by the laws of economics. Um, I, I believe in markets, and I believe in scarcity, and I believe in all, all those things. Um, but who gets what and why is dictated more by power, practice, and culture than it is by such economic diktats. And we had a certain way of doing things, and maybe that was just a glimmering exception to the possible uh, in which the country was chastened by the Great Depression. There was a shared sense of social purpose after the Second World War. I would not underestimate the importance of the GI Bill in forging an American middle class. The Cold War had a salutary effect of giving the US a reason not to make capitalism look like a Dickensian version of capitalism where you squeeze every ounce of suffering out of the workers possible. But all those things are long gone. We don't think about the Depression. We don't think about World War II. And we don't think about, wow, if we make capitalism look ugly, then everyone's going to become commies uh, because you know communism isn't quite on the rise anymore. And so without those constraints on the practice of capitalism, it does become something closer to the capitalism of the 1890s. And the capitalism of the 1890s was really, really scary and ugly. Um, now we haven't got the progressive movement in the early 20th century as a backlash against that. So the hope is uh, the young people in the room will participate in the backlash uh, that restores uh, good progressive economic policies and saves uh, the American ability to practice ebbed foreign policies. But uh, I fear I won't be here to see it. Hey, let's do this just really quick. Let's, um, you're from computers, right? So let's take um, a few more questions real quickly. I'm going to collect the two together, if you know what I mean. So the gentleman sitting next to the professor, I wanted to ask, and then you in the back wanted to ask together. And then I'm going to throw in one last little concluding question. We'll hear from Professor Kirchner, and then we'll have to do the session. Um, thank you very much, Professor. So the purpose of U.S. matters, of course, but the international politics is also very interactive. So let's shift the discussion to talking about the purpose of other ma major actors, both U.S. allies and adversaries. So my question is, in your um, theoretical model, would they continue to welcome the global governance of the so-called U.S. order? Or in your model, how would they, by uh, the purpose of other key international actors, impact the, glo the global order? Thank you. You touched on briefly the role or the role the, the Iraq war might not have played in a sort of forgetting about or not caring about maintaining the American order anymore. I was just curious because it seemed to me like the first attempt at like clearly oppositionally defining our purpose after the Cold War is the war on terror and it was a catastrophic failure that we realized about the time you said that we sort of forgot about the order. Um, so, like, why do you think that it's not as important as social and economic changes domestically? Sure. Why don't you, why don't you answer those off by last question? Sure. Um, as to your first question, I think it matters in terms of the orchestration of order that there are more important actors in the system who are not military allies or politi political allies or military dependencies of the United States. The really cool thing about the American order in the, like, say, 50s, 60s, and 70s is that when problems arose, basically it was US political allies who sat around a table and hammered out the solution. And if there are global problems that emerge today, uh, at, sitting at the table must be states who have disparate political ambitions than the United States. And so that will be harder to achieve. Um, but I don't think that that 
undermines the question of whether the U.S. will be benefited by pursuing a far-sighted foreign policy of enlightened self-interest as opposed to a narrow, quote-unquote, America first self-interested foreign policy, even by the metric of a, you know, what is the metric of foreign policy? The metric of foreign policy is, are you achieving the political goals for which you're introducing your foreign policy measures to achieve? And so my argument is that what we had learned is that we do better if we pursue far-sighted milieu goals and not short-sighted transactionalist goals. I think what your intervention adds to that question is that with more powerful states posturing adversarial positions to the United States, the ability of the U.S. to quote-unquote get what it wants and achieve what it wants in the world is in any event going to be more complicated. Um, as for the Iraq War, the Iraq War is just you know, incredibly important. Um, I uh, was a bitter, bitter uh, opponent of that war. Bitter, bitter, bitter. Um, and in fact, one of the many, many things that I wrote in bitter, bitter opposition to that war was written at the height of its success. I think it was published the day of the mission accomplished uh, landing. So I wasn't, I was not a fair weather friend. I thought before, during, and after it was going to be a catastrophe. And for more or less uh, the right reasons, which is, you know, yeah, we can probably roll over this joint, uh, but then what, what, what I like to call it as an IR scholar, the day after problem, right? What's going to happen the day after? And it did not look pretty. The stakes on the table, and this is Steve Walt's position, and I disagree with Steve, but, I have, but, but his position is a fair one, which is the Americans can't do it. Uh, if you let the Americans loose, then Iraq war things are the inevitable consequence of that. And people like me say, no, 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 the Americans can do it. Sometimes they do idiotic things, but on balance, you know, they do, their, their presence is better than their absence, and we really just need to work super hard on not having them do idiotic things. And every time we do an idiotic thing, you think, okay, now we've learned our lesson. But no, we don't. You know, it's just like, it's like 10 to 15 years later, we'll do an idiotic thing again. But so the theoretical question is, Again, is having that capacity to engage the world with, with such power and authority, does the, is part and parcel of that doing incredibly stupid things? And it is a fair argument to say that it kind of is. My perspective, which is a flag-waving, engaged American internationalism, again, with an emphasis on politics over the exercise of military force, although, I mean, that has to be in the looming in the background some capacity elsewhere, is that it can be done. But again, a, a counter-argument is, you know, a more Hippocratic approach, right, which is first do no harm, and the Americans keep doing harm. But I do think that the Americans have, you know, if I look at the post-war era, I also see a lot of uh, tremendous accomplishments scattered amongst uh, the harm. I hope that comes close to answering your question. So let me just ask one more question. Um, um, I, I suspect you revealed a, a lot in that last answer. I suspect that we kind of got a glimpse, and your smile suggests that I'm right, sure. that we kind of got a glimpse for what you really believe, that you're actually a more optimistic guy than you're letting on, that <laughs> That's there's this core of optimism, which might be right, which is wrapped in this layer of cynicism and fatalism and defeatism. And there's a, there's a handful of, of different things I heard in the course of the talk that makes me think that. The first one is, what you're saying is all you folks who feel the doldrums of American foreign policy and the sense of defeatism, the problem that we face is not one of power, which would be really hard to fix. Mm -hmm. The problem is just purpose. And so we just have to change our will. And although you said it in a negative way, we're not gonna change our will, we're divided, we all hate each other, we distrust each other. At least you diagnose the problem on the much more malleable part. That's one. Number two is throughout your talk, you highlighted all these different times when America looked at what was going on in the world, so that's not working and changed its purpose. Sure, 45 after multiple catastrophes, but also in 1981, we changed our direction in ways that you found regrettable, but nevertheless, we changed how we structured our economy and in response to other perceived failures of how the direction of the American economy. And I think you just talked about optimistically about we don't always have to get our national security policy wrong. We can look at Iraqs and we're not gonna banish them forever. We'll make mistakes, but we'll make fewer mistakes or the mistakes will have a half-life in which they'll immunize us temporarily from equally stupid mistakes. 
And so if I'm walking away from here, one thing I'm taking is, is the good news is the problems we face are not, in your view, it's not our capacity, it's the current state of our domestic politics, number one. Number two, these things can change. And even as you described, I mean, like the argument that you believe is out there for how to fix the, the, the distribution of spoils in the, in, in the US economy, and it's, it's do something to give side payments to the folks who are losing. Mm -hmm. So you even say there's an argument out there, and you're basically saying is we just have to fix these domestic political things before we can be as successful a steward of international politics as we were for 75 years. But is that, does that actually have kind of a resonance with you, or is that just me picking out the happiest part of your story um, because it's a nicer way to end the evening on a snowy night? So I, I will leave the last word to Gore Vidal, <laughs> in which you, you characterized uh, my, my cynicism, my pessimism, and my despair quite accurately, but said, but, but underneath the cynicism, pessimism, and despair, uh, you know, we can see the, a sea of optimism that's, that's there. And, and, and Gore Vidal was once asked what was hiding behind his frosty exterior, and he said, if you crack the ice of my exterior, underneath you will find cold water. <laughs> well, well, I have to say that's the first thing you said all the evening that I didn't believe. Um, thank you so much for that cheery final note. Thank you so much for having me. It's, been, it's a real pleasure. Thanks so much for coming out on a snowy day.